All right, so we're talking about thermodynamics this week in lab. Um, probably the biggest thing that we're going to talk about is this Gibbs free energy right here. Um, you have this equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Uh, delta G is your free energy. That's kind of like the energy you have available to do some work. Delta G, it tells you about the spontaneity of the reaction. When I say spontaneous, I'm not talking about speed of reaction. I'm just talking about whether or not it's going to go by itself. Um, so for instance, I may, if it's a non-spontaneous reaction, I'm going to need to put some sort of energy into the system to make it go. Whereas if it's a spontaneous reaction, it'll just go by itself, right? It can be really fast or really slow. Um, an example of this is like carbon turning into diamonds when it's under really high heat and intense pressure um, that takes years and years and years and years but it is technically a spontaneous reaction because it happens right so um, that's just something to keep in mind when I say spontaneous we're not talking about speed right it's just if I have to put energy into it or not um, if this delta G if this is greater than zero so it's a positive number the reaction is non spontaneous right if it is lower than zero, then you can say that the reaction is spontaneous. Right? So delta G is dependent on two different things, enthalpy and entropy. This is the enthalpy function. This is the entropy function. Right? So enthalpy, we're basically thinking of the heat that is gained or lost during the reaction. Right, so you might mix things in a test tube and feel some heat, like if it's an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction where you absorb heat. That's the enthalpy of these reactions. So it's the amount of heat that's being transferred between your system and the surroundings around it. Um, entropy, on the other hand, we can think of that as just the change in disorder or chaos during the reaction. Um, so increasing the entropy or the disorder in the system makes the reaction more spontaneous or more likely to happen. On the other side of things, lowering the disorder of the system results in a negative entropy, which makes the reaction less likely to happen or less spontaneous. So basically the way to think about entropy is that things want to go to a place where there's more disorder or more freedom is another way of looking at it, right? If I have two molecules that are bound together, right? and I could do some reaction that puts them apart where they have more freedom, they're going to like that, right? They're going to be more disordered because they have two chilling around instead of just one, but they're also going to have a lot more freedom. So that's one way to think of entropy. Things want to go towards more freedom and more disorder. Um, so whether or not any reaction happens is a balance between the entropy and the enthalpy of the reaction. So this holds true for everything. I mean, this is like why everything in the universe basically happens if it's spontaneous or not, is dependent on this idea. Right? So it's a balance between the enthalpy portion and the entropy portion and the temperature that you're doing it at. So we're going to explore this in the lab. That's kind of the whole function of what we're doing. Um, so what we actually are doing, we're going to measure the heat that is either given off or absorbed in water. So we're going to take some salts, we're going to dissolve them in water, and we're going to measure the heat. Um, we're going to measure the delta H of the dissolution of those salts. To do this, we're going to use something that looks like this. We're going to have a couple styrofoam cups, and we're going to put some water in there. Instead of metal, we'll put in like our, our salt or something. And then we'll put in a temperature probe up here. And then we'll shake it all up. And as the thing is being uh, dissolved in water, you're going to get a temperature change. It's either going to go up or it's going to go down. You're going to put your water in there, swirl it, and you're going to record that temperature change. right? Because if we know the amount of change in temperature of the water surrounding the reaction that's going on, we can kind of use that to calculate how much heat was actually given off by our reaction, and that'll give us the enthalpy, right? So we'll have 50 milliliters of water in this little makeshift calorimeter, and we're going to add the salt to it. We're going to quickly cap it, and we're going to measure the change in temperature of the solution using a temperature probe. The change in temperature that we measure will allow us to calculate the enthalpy of the reaction. So how is that actually going to work? Well, before we go through this, we just want to define a couple things for you. When we talk about stuff, um, you have like system and you have surroundings. The system is really what you're focusing on and what you're really working with. The surroundings is the stuff like around it, right? So um, for this specific uh, 
experiment. We're calling the system, it's kind of hard to think about, but we're really thinking about the system is just that microscopic area of water where the salt is actually being dissolved, right? And what we're calling the surroundings is actually like the, the full bunch of water that's going to be in the calorimeter that we do. So it's kind of hard to visualize that in this lab, but we're saying that what we have the temperature probe in that just bunch of water solution, we're calling that the surroundings, where just the spot right around the sample we're going to call the system. Right. Now, if you have a Q, which Q is heat, but we'll talk about that in a minute, if it's negative, that means that your system is losing heat. Really, if anything, if you have negative entropy, that means you're losing entropy negative enthalpy you're losing heat right um, that means that the system so Q system is negative that means that the system is losing heat and that means it's giving it away so that the surroundings should be getting hotter because your system is losing heat but if your Q system is positive that means it's gaining heat so it's got to be pulling that heat in from the surroundings right and you should see a temperature drop around that um, so um, let's say if we're going to calculate our delta H of this. Let's say we dissolve 2 grams of salt into 50 milliliters of water, and when dissolved, the temperature of the solution was raised by 10 degrees Celsius. So we threw salt in the water, we swirled it all up in here, and the temperature went up 10 degrees as it dissolved. Let's find our enthalpy of the reaction. So uh, first thing we're going to remember is this thing called the law of conservation of energy. Basically, what that's saying is that no energy can be created or destroyed. Your energy is always just going to transfer between one state and another. You're not going like, to create energy. So basically, what we can say then, if we call Q heat, the heat of the surroundings is equal to the negative heat of the system. So basically, what that's saying is that any heat that I gain in my surroundings had to have be exactly equal to the stuff lost by the system and the exact opposite anything that I gained by the system had to be lost by the surroundings because no energy can like come from nowhere it has to either come from the surroundings or the system it can't come in from anywhere else or it can't be created in any way right so what I have italicized here that's to say no energy can be lost during the reaction any heat that is picked up by the surroundings had to be lost by the system and vice versa exactly so if we want to find Q of the surroundings because that's what we're going to be measuring is the surroundings with our temperature probe we want to find the heat the heat that was gained because the temperature was raised by the surroundings well we have this equation to talk about it Q equals M C S delta T. M is the mass of the solution. This is mass of the water and the salt that you dissolved, right? Cs is the specific heat of water. That's base specific heat is just a measure of how much energy do you have to put into water to get it to raise up a degree Celsius, right? So you can see right here, for each gram of water, you need 4.184 joules, which is a measure of energy per gram degree Celsius, right? Delta T is the change in temperature, right? So mass equals 52 grams because we're taking into account the 2 grams of salt we added plus the weight of the 50 milliliters of water, which works out to 52 grams, times 4.184 times delta T, which is 10, right? So if we put this in, we have Q surroundings equals 52 times that times that. We get this, 2,000 joules roughly. Now remember up here, we can't lose any heat, so any heat we got in the surroundings, we had to have got from the system. And we want to know about the system, we want to know about those salts, we want to know what happens, how much enthalpy is, 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 is coming when you, um, when you dissolve the salt in the water. So we're going to convert this to where we're dealing with the Q of the system, not necessarily the surroundings. Well, we know that the Q surroundings is equal to negative Q system, so we just take that. And Q system is just the negative of that number. Once you get the heat that's in there, all you got to do to get delta H is take the Q of the system divided by the moles of the salt. Right? So let's just say we used 5 moles of salt. We just take this number, 2,000 divided by 5. We get negative 435 joules. Right? So we know that the enthalpy of this reaction using this method is equal to negative 435 joules. But... Remember, we also have this entropy thing that we got to deal with, too. So we know delta H. Now we need to determine delta S in order to determine whether or not the reaction is spontaneous or not. 
Okay, so we've solved this, now we just need to get delta s. We can't really experimentally measure delta s, so we're just going to get this from a table of known values that we use. Right? And so let's say we're working with barium chloride. Some of these numbers I just kind of made up, but you go to a table that you'll have when you do the lab, and you can um, you can just look it up, right? So if I want to look at the dissolution of barium chloride, right, and figure out what the entropy of that is, I'm going to use this equation. I'm going to take the delta S of reaction is equal to the sum of the S, the standard entropy of the products, minus the standard entropy of the reactant. So what does this look like? We have barium chloride going to barium ions and chloride ions. So delta S equals sum of the entropy of the products, sum of the entropy of the reactants. So my delta S equals, I'm going to add up the entropy values that I get from a table that you will have for barium 2 plus 9.6 and chloride 2, because I have two of them, times 55, which is the, for the amount for chloride. Um, from that, I'm going to subtract 122.6, which is what it is for barium chloride, according to that chart. And my delta S works out to be negative 3 joules per mole Kelvin. So I have a net loss of entropy, which remember is not good. Typically, if things are going to be spontaneous, they're going to move more towards higher entropy. So we'd want to see a positive value here. Right? So let's put this in and see what we can get. We know what our entropy is. And we know what our enthalpy is, so let's go down here. Let's see what we can learn from it. We know that delta H equals negative 435 joules per mole. Delta S equals negative 3 joules per mole Kelvin. So let's throw this into our equation. Our temperature is Kelvin, and that's the temperature that the reaction took place in. So we did it at room temperature, so we'll just say 298 Kelvin. This isn't like the delta T you measure. This is just the, the Kelvin of the room, right? the temperature of the room. So we'll put everything in that we have. We have delta G equals negative 435 joules per mole minus 298K times minus 3 joules per mole Kelvin. And this works itself out to 458 joules per mole, right? Or 0.4 kilojoules per mole. Now, what can we learn from what we just got here? Right? Well, we can see that delta G is greater than zero. So I can say, based on what we talked about back here, my reaction is non-spontaneous. To get this to go, I'm going to have to put a bunch of energy into it to make it really work. Or I'm going to have to gather that energy from somewhere else. Um, what causes the reaction to be non-spontaneous? Right? That's a good question. Um, well... My delta H is minus 435. That's not too bad. But my delta S... I'm losing entropy. So that entropy penalty that you're losing is kind of what's making me not be spontaneous. It's not enough of a delta H to really make this work, right? So a reaction gaining entropy is spontaneous according to our math. We lost some entropy during the reaction. This pushed us to being non-spontaneous. We can also see if the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. Well, if we said the reaction heated up, by 10 degrees Celsius, we had to release heat, right? So it must be exothermic. In the same way, if delta H is negative, right? If my my um, system back over here is negative, I got to be losing heat, right? If Q is negative, that means the system is losing heat. So the system is giving off heat into the surroundings. So I can tell by my delta H being negative that it's also exothermic. So you can see that by getting this number and looking at what these values are, we can learn a lot about what the reaction is and what drives it to completion. And so that is what we're doing uh, this week in lab. Um, a lot of these numbers, if you go through, I made up a lot of these off the top of my head. Oops. So these aren't exactly correct. I don't think these are the exact correct book values for these as well, but I think that should give you a pretty good idea of how we can do an experiment like this and get a lot of information about the reaction, right? So all we're doing this week is just taking two different salts and dissolving it in water and measuring the change in temperature and doing this math that I outlined here to figure out what delta G is and what drives the reaction.